Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Just want to make sure you can hear me. All right, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I see you, sis. Shout out to you, sis. Weird MC in the building. Um, hello, Akon, Carol, Iris, Chooks, for me, and uh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is on the call. Oh my word! Hi, everyone. So, welcome to another live stream conversation uh, on scent. Let me know if you can hear me. Uh, drop a comment just very quickly. Let me know what part of the world you are watching this, and then we can get the show on the road. So just drop a comment. Um, Jesus says hello, sir. Hello, Jesus. <laughs> London, London in the building. Awesome stuff. So let's do this in just a moment. All right. Lagos, Nigeria. Jesus, Chooks is in Lagos. That's cool. Okay, okay. So we're just getting a few more people join us. Jesus is in Lagos. Born with in the UK. Awesome. All right. So we're going to begin um, in exactly 60 seconds. We're just going to go straight into it. And every other person can join us along the way. So... Let's uh, see where other people are call calling from, watching from. Already. Okie dokie. Just uh, 30 more seconds and we shall get straight to it. <laughs> I should be able to spot my message. Yes. Spot about there we go. London, Nika is in London. Hi, Nika. All righty. Just get my notes. Just a moment. I can show my notes already. Alrighty, okie dokie. So, hi everyone. Once again, welcome to Scent. And for those of you who perhaps may not be very familiar with this platform, this is a discipleship platform for the lack of a better term. I'm getting in touch with my spiritual, spiritual side, uh, but this is an assignment that I feel very strongly that God would have us disciple one another, um, particularly in areas and matters relating to the kingdom. Um, a lot of us have a religious or church background and i don't have anything against that all right i'm pro church in every way shape or form but i think that a lot of us have been coddled into believing that the church is the destination that the church is the kingdom of god and everything we do concerning church is enforcing or establishing the kingdom of god on on um, on earth I, I have a little bit of a disagreement with that, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, so, you know, a lot of us have been, you know, told, you know, or taught that um, as church, we are, yes, we are the light of the world and so on and so forth. But Sense actually is a discipleship platform to get those of us who have been um, inspired and trained and mentored and nurtured in church to go out of church to go into the world and preach the good news to, you know, those of us who are the light to be inspired to go back into the, into the darkness, so to speak, and become the light in the darkness. I feel like a lot of us who are in church or have been in church are happy to be content to in Goshen, and we don't care if Egypt burns, you know, as long as the plagues of Egypt don't affect us in Goshen, we're happy. A lot of us feel like, a lot of us in church are like 
Um, we are saved. We're in, we're in the ark, Noah's ark, and we don't care if the world drowns or is taken by flood. When what God wants to do is to make sure that you establish arcs, so to speak, where everyone is saved. And being saved is not just a religious ticket to get you to escape the earth and give you, thank you, Nika, and give you a one-way ticket to heaven. Because that's what we've been taught, that you, we're just waiting for the trumpets to sound. Thank you. Exactly, Iris. I love it from nightclubs to light clubs. There we go. I love it. Right? So we don't just feel like we've been faith to get to heaven um, because the earth is no good. Heaven is not a relo relocation plan. When God created the heavens and the earth, and even since Jesus, the goal was not to relocate you to heaven. Being born again is a real, it's a, um, it's an immigration policy, but establishing on the kingdom is a governmental mandate. Can I say that again? Being born again or being Christian is an immigration policy. It's an immigration pathway, but God wants you to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus didn't preach about being born again. And I don't have anything wrong with the message of being born again. But what I am saying is that the message that Jesus kept continually kept talking about was repent, change your thinking, change from, you know, turn aside from your habits and behaviors because the kingdom of heaven is here, right? And in sense, my job is to mentor, disciple, handle, um, all of us, so that we can find our place on the earth, representing, um, I'm going to make Apostle, um, Apostle Ajane, if you don't mind, I'm going to make you co-host. So if you don't mind, you could please help me with um, muting and every other thing. So if you don't mind, help me with that. Thank you. All right. So the purpose of sense is to disciple, give guidance, mentor, and pretty much handle you know, all of us in our journey to find where we fit in, particularly on this journey with God. All right. So that said, I want to keep this short. And today we're going to be talking about, um, you know, whatever happened in the garden. And the topic that came into my mind in the email I sent today was, um, are you God-like or are you like God? Okay. Now, for those of us who are in the Telegram group, you would notice that yesterday I gave a question or I asked the question, which was, you know, um, why did why was God so adamant about Adam and Eve not touching the fruits in the garden? And I had so many amazing responses, and I love the theological conversations and the mental stimulation that we go through because I think it allows us to understand what God has written in His Word, so that we don't just assume. Because I think a lot of us have gone through church and we've assumed a lot of things. And I'm just going to hear, I'm going to share my own perspective. I'm not saying my perspective is 100% accurate. This is a Bible study for the lack of a better term. Um, I will share my, 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 my thought after which, you know, uh, Apostle Ajane would help with uh, Q&A so that if you've got questions, we can, we can thrash it out together. But the beautiful thing about this is this is a journey, okay? This is a journey. All right, so let's get into it. So are we God-like or are we like God? Now, if you remember in scripture, right, in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, man and woman, or man as the case may be, let man have complete authority or dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth and over everything that creeps and crawls over the earth. Now, that was the instruction. That was the mandate. But let's go back just a little bit. You've heard, if you're following me for any length of time since I've been talking about this, you re remember that I keep saying to you, um, first off, God is not a religious figure. God is a king, right? Religion is just one of his foreign policy thrusts to get people into the kingdom. Time does not permit, I'm not gonna go into that. Um, you can watch the replay of last week's session. I went into that a little bit more extensively, but God is not a religious figure, God is a king. Now, second thing I want you to remember is God is not his name, God is his office. 
That's why the Bible would say things, and Jesus would say things like, well, you are gods, but you will die like men, you know? So God is not God's name. God is the office, the title he owns, all right? His name is, depending on different pronunciation, it is Yahweh. Some people call him Jehovah, but that is his name. God is his office, all right? So God says, he gives this instruction and says, let us make man first in his image and likeness. Now, what does it mean to be made in someone's image and likeness? Because, you know, sometimes we just read the scripture and the words just roll over our tongue, image and likeness, but we don't necessarily give much thought to it because the Bible for us is a text that we do not dispute and we just take it. And, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I do believe that the Bible is the word of God that has been inspired by several men across different uh, you know, generations, destinations, and locations. But I, I do believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. All right. So what does it mean to be made in someone's image and likeness? So let's just look a little bit at the word image, just a little Bible study, right? So image talks about a visual representation, right? So an image is a visual uh, representation. So for example, if you looked into the mirror, the mirror would reflect a visual representation of who you are, all right? If you looked into the mirror, it would give you a visual representation of who you are. However, that image lacks substance. So it may look like you, it may have the similitude of you, it may have your nose and stuff, but it's not real, it's not physical, it's, it's not corporeal, if you know what I'm saying. You can't touch it, you can't hold it. Even if you put your hand to the mirror, you can't feel flesh. So it is an image, it is just a visual representation of who you are, but it has no substance, all right? Um, and then second, he says that let us make man in our likeness. Now, what does it mean to be in the likeness? Well, to be, to be in likeness means having similar features or characteristics. Having similar features and characteristics. So, for example, I can take a picture of um, Fumi, for example, and give it to an artist to draw. The artist will draw Fumi, right? But the art, what the artist will draw is the features and the characteristics. So it it, it is a it is a, what let me put it this way. It is the it is a an appropriation is the word. It is an appropriation of who I am. So it could be my name, it could be my photograph, it could be my likeness, it could be an art design. It could have some features and characteristics of who I am, all right? So let's get it straight. So first off, the image is a visual representation and the likeness are the features and characteristics, okay? Now, in other ways you can say, image and likeness refers to the characters and the competencies. So God says, let us make man having our visual re representation, having our character and our competencies, and then let them have dominion, okay? So what is the first thing that God gives Adam or gives man, as the case may be, he gives man dominion. And he, it says in uh, verse 26 of Genesis 1, um, let them, let man have complete authority or, or dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, over the entire earth, and over th everything that creeps and crawls over the entire earth. All right, so let's just get, we're making pro progress. Now, let's get into the crux of the matter because we're talking about what happened in the fall. So as you know this story, um, God first creates man as a spirit, and then several verses later, he creates the, the body of man from the dust, and ultimately he creates uh, Eve uh, from the rib of Adam, and then he gives them the assignment. And then he says to them in Genesis 2, verse 16 through 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, right, saying, you may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day you eat from it, you will most certainly die. All right, I'm going to say that again. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree in the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So I, I want to quickly ask a question. And please drop a comment if you can. So when the Bible says God commanded man not to eat of the garden, I just want to be clear so that we're all on the same page. Just drop a comment. Was he talking about Adam? Was he talking about Eve? Or was he talking about the spirit man that he had created in Genesis 1, 26? Because if you remember in Genesis 1, 26, he says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. He makes man, but he doesn't make the body of man. And then in Genesis 2, that we just read in verse 16, he then says to the man, you should eat of, the, of every tree except uh, the tree of the, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. So my question really is, what did God, which man was he speaking to? Was he speaking to the spirit man or was he speaking to Adam as, 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 as can be? All right, let me see. Uh, heir to the kingdom says spirit man. Okay, cool. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Drop a comment, guys. I'd like to know. What do you think? Who, which man was he speaking to? Was he speaking to Adam as an individual or was he speaking to that spirit that he had formed? Word MC says he was speaking to the formed man. So he was speaking to Adam as a physicality. All right. Iris says he said it to Adam and his spirit man. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Max says Adam. Paul Selagene says Adam. All right. You think the formed man, Adam as well. All right. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great, great, great. Great, 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 great. I also, I also do agree with you. I do think he was speaking to Adam as well. So he tells him, you should freely, unconditionally eat from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shall you not eat. Otherwise, on the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now let's go to Genesis 3, verse 5. Then I'm going to tie it all together and uh, we'll call it a day. All right, Genesis 3, verse 5. The serpent comes into the garden. The Bible has talked about, did a little bit of an intro about the serpent, so I'm not going to go into it. But Genesis 3, verse 5, the serpent approaches Eve and says, for God knows, he preludes and says, did God really say you can't eat of any of the trees? Right? Did God really say you can't eat out of any of the trees? She says, no, no, that's not true. And God says we can eat anything. We just can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan says, or the, this, the serpent says, for God knows that on the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Other translations say you would be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. If you can, I'd like you to underline and just hold that thought that says you will be like God. Right? You will be like God. Let me open uh, my Bible here as well. There's something I just want to touch on that really briefly. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. All right, cool. So um, just to be sure. Um, do, 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 do. Turn, just, so just, yes. All right, cool. Um, verse two, the woman said to the serpents, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, except from the tree, sorry, except the fruit from the tree, which is in the middle of the garden. God says, you shall not eat it, nor touch it, otherwise you will die. Then the serpent says, you will certainly not die. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, you will have greater awareness, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. Hmm. Also hold that thought, if you can also underline it, that line that says, okay, well, different translations, if the Amplified, it says you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. So if you have the Amplified, you can underline that part that says, knowing the difference between good and evil. All right. So here's the question that I want to ask, and this is what brought us here today. Why was God so adamant? No pun intended, Adam, adamant. Yes, I'm sorry. Why was God so adamant that they should stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You would think that, because he didn't say the tree of evil, 
because sometimes I think in our minds, we just, we jumble it all together. The tree of good and evil, we just think of the evil parts. So what's wrong with being good? Why should, why should God have a problem with something that is good? We can, we can understand the evil part. That's a, the ev if I said, what, you know, if I said, what problem should God have with evil? We would understand that in a heartbeat. But what's God's problem with good? Why is God saying, I don't even want you to get close to good? Evil, we can understand it. That's a, that's a, that's a no-brainer. But God says, I don't even want you to touch good. What is so bad about being good? Do you get where I'm coming with, from with this? What could possibly be so bad about being good? Let me read some comments. Uh, Iris says he wanted, he wanted to give us free choice. Yes, that's true. Heir to the Kingdom says the problem was knowing it for ourselves apart from him. All right, I love it. Sharon says because goodness doesn't always equate righteousness. Interesting. That's very interesting. Nika says being like God. Interesting. 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 But let me ask you this, Nika. Weren't they already like God? Because in the previous verse, in Genesis 1, 26, he makes man, if I'm not mistaken, we've read it. He makes man, and then he says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let us make man like us. In fact, in fact, hold on a second. When God cast them out of the garden, in Genesis 3, verse 22, if you can take a quick look there, Genesis 3, 22, and the Lord God said, Nika, Behold, the man has become like us. The man has become like us. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat his fruits and live forever. So he was already like God. I, I'm hoping, I, I'm trying to just calm down because I, I, I'm a little too excited. My brain, my mouth, my brain is moving faster than my, my, my mouth. So I'm a little caught up. So um, let's breathe. <laughs> All right, check it out. Nika says, okay, let me read more comments. Um, let's see. Um, let me skip to the beginning. Um, because goodness doesn't always equate righteousness. Um, Jumoke says, good is not necessarily God. Uh, Weird MC says, man could start defining good by himself. Good is subjective. Before the foundation of the earth, he already put Jesus on the cross, yes. Nana says, two thoughts. Either good is not like right, but it's just a similitude, or because this is not our sphere. It's not something that we're supposed to consider just for him to decide, still thinking about it. All right, I love it. Beautiful comments. Thank you, Paul Sajani. Fantastic, right? So if, if God said, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of evil. It's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory to us. Evil is bad, quote unquote. Therefore, don't touch it. But God says, don't even touch good because even good is bad. How can good be bad? How can the knowledge of good and evil be bad? So the argument first off is not like, it's not because remember what the, remember what the serpent said to them. He said to them, hold up, wait a minute. The, the serpent said to them, he said, God knows that on the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened true. And you know, this is the thing that Satan does. Satan does, Satan, even though he's, the Bible calls him the father of lies. So for something to be a lie, it doesn't have to be 100% a lie. It, you just need to remove an element of truth from the equation. Do you get what I'm saying? So for something to be a lie, it doesn't have to wholeheartedly be a lie. It just needs an absence of truth. So guess what? Satan said, God knows that the day you eat on it, your eyes will be opened. True. You will be like God. Not true. <laughs> Are you with me so far? Check it out. Satan says, I'll say it again. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. False. God knows the day you will eat of the fruit of it, your eyes will be open. True. And you will be like God. False. So let's touch the falsehood, shall we? And this is this for me is where, thank you, Nikki, you, you, you got it. This is where we're coming into the issue, 
right? So God said that the day you eat from it, you will die. Now let's explain what that line means. <clears throat> now, during the time they're in the garden, we don't know how old Adam and Eve were, all right? We only know, in fact, we don't even know how old they were, if I'm not mistaken. We don't know how old they were when they were kicked out of the garden. We have records for how old Adam was when he died. He, Adam died, I think, at the age of 930 years old. The Bible does not record Eve's age or her passing, so we don't know how long she lived. But Adam was about 930, if I'm not mistaken, years old when he, when he died. We don't know how old he was when he, he got kicked out of the garden. So it wasn't like, okay, and 700 years later, Adam died. No, there's no record for exactly when Adam died. Now, this is my hypothesis. And remember the theme of what, what we're talking about, that they were at the end of this journey, this issue, man remained godlike, but was no longer like God. And I'm going to explain, so just hang a hat on that somewhere. Now, I was saying we don't know exactly how old Adam was when he, he got kicked out of the garden or so on and so forth, or how God began to record his age, so to speak, from the moment of creation. But what we do know was that he was 930 years old when he died. Now, Satan was correct, or the serpent was correct, where he said, on the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Now, what do I mean by that? Because in my opinion, the life of Adam, or no, before I go into that, pause, hold that thought. Trick question. I want you to give me, give me a yes or no. Was Adam, were, were, were Adam and Eve immortal when God created them? Another trick question. Were Adam and Eve immortal when God created them? Iris says yes, yes. Manuel says yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes? Nana says yes. She's not just like, really? Trick question. Freddy says yes. <laughs> okay. So they were, they were immortal. Okay. Okay, beautiful. I don't think they were immortal. I don't think they're immortal. And I'm going to show you. <laughs> I don't think they're immortal, and I'm going to show you. All right? So Satan says, for the God says, God knows the day you eat from it, your eyes will be, uh, no. God says, um, sorry, verse four, the serpent said to the woman, you will certainly not die. All right? So let's see if I, I'm right or wrong. I'm, I'm open to being wrong, Iris. I'm very open to being wrong. I'm not the 100% authority here. We're all learning together. All right? I think they were not immortal, and I'll tell you why. Let's go to, um, where are you? Where are you? Let's go to, and I've, I've read the scripture already anyway. Let's go to, uh, yes, Genesis 3, verse 22. Genesis 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, let me read this in King James. King James Bible over there. All right. Uh, can somebody read it for me? Apostle Ajane, if you don't mind, you can read it for me. I'm just trying to find my KJV. Just read it for me in, in what you have. Genesis 3, 22. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. I'm in the amplified version. Um, okay. Genesis 3, 22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in this fallen, sinful condition forever. What's that? What's that last line again? Give me that last line again. <laughs> <laughs> and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in this fallen sinful condition forever. And live in this fallen sinful condition forever. So God says, don't let them touch that tree of life because if they touch it, they're gonna live forever. So correct me if I'm wrong. I, I stand to be corrected guys. I don't think God created them immortal. I don't think he created them immortal because the Bible clearly says, according to Apostle Ajene, in the amplified version, <laughs> that God said that, behold, the man has become like one of us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand 
he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruits and live forever. So let's hold that thought, all right? I hope this is making sense, okay? Let's make it, let's, let's see if the, we'll take questions, don't worry guys, just let me, let me land the plane and then you all can come at me with your shotguns and, and everything. <laughs> all right, so, so for me, I don't, you know, it seems clear because if they were already immortal, God wouldn't need to say to them, don't let them touch the tree. They've already touched it. So I don't think they were immortal already, right? And this, this is my thought. Satan was right, uh, you know, um, God was right that they would surely die because from the moment they ate of the, the tree, in my opinion, I feel like their life was sustained in God. That their relationship and proximity to God was a self-sustaining, for the lack of a better term, sustaining life source. Allow me to use those, those words. And I, and I say that to, I say that from the perspective of the moment they ate from the tree, they traded in eternity for time. You know, the Bible says that God has hidden eternity in his heart. So God isn't bound by time or even eternity. He transcends it. So in my opinion, in my understanding, their lives we're already being fully sustained based on proximity, presence, and relationship with God. Because God exists outside of time, space, and eternity. And that proximity to them would, for the lack of a better term, sustain them. And the moment they ate of the fruit, it seemed, in my opinion, it seemed that they traded eternity, quote-unquote, for time. Because from that moment, because we don't know how many years Adam and Eve lived, quote unquote, before the fall. But from that moment, the Bible begins to record the length of time that man would live. So Adam would live 930, Methuselah would live 969, Lamech would live this. You know, from that point on, we began to equate the number of days such that I think in Genesis 12, if I'm not mistaken, God talks about maybe after the flood, he says, no, before the flood, he said his spirit will no longer contend with man for their days are short and man would live, he said, and man would live, if I'm not mistaken, 120 years old or something like that. That, that. It was from that point of time, we began to age man as the case may be. Let me get to my second point, all right? Or my third point. Don't worry, guys, you'll, you'll have your questions in a moment. So let's see. Yes, I remember where I was. So, what could be so wrong about the knowledge of good and evil? Like I said, if evil was on the table alone, we could simply say, well, yes, yes, yes. We understand why God doesn't want man to touch evil. But God didn't even want man to touch good. So what problem should God have with good and evil? Now, let me give you my thoughts. Then um, we will close it out and we'll have questions. Right? <laughs> Personally, I think, personally, I think that the moment you are, no, before I go into that, you know, there's this phrase we use around Christian circles. We call it, um, so when we say that man fell and man sinned, man took up sin consciousness. You remember that? We've said that before. It's part of our regular theology that, you know, by sin, one man came into the world and so on and so forth. And man had sin consciousness. So we knew that we were doing something wrong. Guess what? Because, for example, the moment that um, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the Bible says their eyes were opened and they knew, right, that they were naked, right? Their eyes were open. Let me look for it. Their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. Where is that? Um, um, yes, 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 yes. Verse seven in Genesis three. Um, then the eyes of the two of them were opened and they knew they were naked and fastened fig leaves together and made themselves covering coverings. So the moment they ate the fruit, their awareness were, was opened and they felt a sense of shame. They felt a sense of embarrassment. They felt a sense of separation such that they needed to clothe themselves with fig leaves and so on and so forth. So this is what I think. I think that 
God is not bound by relativisms such as good and evil. And I'll explain. God is not bound by relativisms such as good as good and evil. So when man sinned, man came into a consciousness. Now here's the interesting thing. When you are conscious of something, most in generally, most in general, it's not a blanket statement. When you're conscious of something, you become subject to it. When you're conscious of something, you become subject to it. So give you an example. If you walk into a restaurant and you've never eaten at a restaurant ever before, and they served you a meal, you would be oblivious to the courtesies and the etiquettes and the manners of eating properly. Social graces go out of the window because you're not conscious of social graces. You're not aware of social graces. Exactly, Jim, okay. You're not aware of social graces. You're not conscious of that. So you will behave without restriction. That's the word I want to use. You will behave without restriction, Nana, until someone looks at you like, no, you're, you're doing it all wrong. And the moment they say you're doing it all wrong and they begin to educate you along the social graces and paradigms, all of a sudden, okay, uh, I think we got a bot in here. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Hello, Tom. I, Goodbye, I'm Tom. Removing people. Okay, thank you. Zoom has really got to fix that. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> oh, we got more people. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. So, because we're unaware of social graces we will behave seemingly without restriction all right don't worry guys I'll, I'll answer your questions later all right right we will behave without restriction so god is not bound by these relativisms he is not subject to it all right so the moment guys that adam and eve eat of the fruit they become subject to the law of sin and death where good and evil is concerned. Now remember, let's go back to the beginning. Remember that God creates them in his image and his likeness. God creates them. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Hold on a second, guys. I think our Zoom dudes. Give me a second. All right. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll do it. Hold on, guys. We have a few people here, a few guests who don't want to, who are oblivious of our things. Who am I removing? Okay. I removed gotcha. those names. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have anyone else that is acting up? I think that's it. I put those people out and I locked the room. Okay, cool. Thank you. All righty. So no problem. Who's Alex? Yeah, I'm removing that person now. I think so. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Okie dokie. <clears throat> right. So, so the moment we're aware, we become subject to, yes, we become subject to those parameters and behaviors. Now, don't forget that God created man in his image and likeness. So one of the things that I wrote here is, um, yes, the serpent said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Eve was enticed with the desire to be like God, not recognizing she was already like God. I'm going to say that again. Eve was enticed with the idea of being like God, not recognizing that she was already like God. And I'm going to explain something to you guys. Hold on. So let me look for the notes that I wrote down. Um, just a moment, guys. I'm looking for what I wrote down. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. All right. So I wrote down, God is not bound by good and evil. So he creates man in his image and likeness and his character and competencies as a representation having certain abilities. Now, guess what? When man fell, man retained God's competencies, but lost God's character. I'm going to say this again. Man 
retained God's competencies, but lost God's character. Now, remember that I said to you that when man fell, man was God-like, but no longer like God because they lost something. So God had given man in the previous verses dominion, Genesis 1. He had given man dominion over all these things. Man retained, when man fell, man retained the responsibilities, but lost the relationship. Are you with me, guys? Man retained the responsibilities, but lost the relationship. Man retained the authority, but lost the access. Are you with me? Man retained the authority, the capacity, the dominion, but lost the access. Man could no longer, God, from the, from the moment they sinned, man, God no longer came, so to speak, in the garden to have conversations with man. That no longer happened. And if you read through the timeline, particularly of the Old Testament, we, we would trace those few conversations that God will have with man. So after Adam and Eve, God, you know, skipped several generations and then goes into people like Noah, then he goes into Abraham, he goes into different things. And, and it seems like all the way from Adam until Jesus, man was having sparse relationships and scarce access to the presence of God. So God was no longer relating with man as he would every day, seemingly as he would in the garden where he would come and talk and fellowship with, with Adam and sustain him by his power, as the case may be. But the moment he fell, man lost access, even though he retained authority. Man lost eternity, even though he retained time. Man, man you know, um, lost God's character, even though he had God's competencies. Man was God-like, and even though he was no longer like God. Now, let me end by asking the question, what, what does it mean to say that man was God-like, but no longer like God? So what did man lose that caused him to no longer be like God? You know, I, I, I posted something in the group, and I said, um, can you be a Christian and not be like Christ? It sounds like a trick question. I think it's, I think it's, I think you can. I think it's possible to be a Christian and not be like Christ. I think so. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I think it's, 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 it, you can have the, you can have the name of your family and not be like the members of your family. Yes, I think they're gone, Apostle. I think they're gone. Yes, thank you. Right? You can be, you can, you can have the name of your father and not be like your father. You can have the name of your father and not be like your father. You can bear, the title or the toga Christian and not be like Christ. You can carry the name of God and not be like God. So what does it mean to be like God? And this is the part that I'm going to touch that we'll call them. Um, we'll handle questions and see if, if we can learn from each other. God is not a moralist, guys. God is not a moralist. Morality, morality, or those relative words are for, defined for the human experience. Because, it, you know, like you've, you've, you've heard me say before, a lot of the things that God allowed in the Old Testament were things that we would not consider good. We would look at them and say, no, that's not fair. Like, why would God say things like, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I, have, have, have I hated? What did Esau truly, 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 truly do that was so terrible? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Ja Jacob's history seems a lot more checkered. Jacob's history seems a whole lot more checkered than whatever Esau did. The only thing we truly kind of really blame Esau about was that he gave away his birthrights for a morsel of, of porridge, as the case may be. But Jacob, Jacob was like a serial cheat, a serial liar, a serial this, a serial that. He had a lot of serial going on. You know what I'm saying? But Esau, we don't really have much to say about Esau. You look at guys like Saul, and Saul seemed like a pretty moral king. You know what I mean? And what happened? God removed him. David was a, a lot more atrocious than God than than Saul, as the case may be. Let me read this question quickly. Um, um, so this question is uh, yes, 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 Ajani. That's fine. Thank you so much. 
Uh, okay, I'm just reading uh, um, questions. Uh, can the comments be deleted too? They're offensive. Um, yes, yes, please. Um, yes, thank you so much. All right, sorry, I was just, I went to the comments. I'll try not to look at the comments when I talk, I get distracted. Um, yeah, so a lot of the things that God did in the Old Testament would be considered as, as bad, right? And a lot of the things that God let people get away with because he, he said he felt that they were good. How would you explain David doing some of the terrible things that David did, but God at the end of David's life says, this man is a man after my own heart. But David killed Philistines, ripped people out of their, you know, killed nations and families, ripped babies out of wombs. You talk about stuff that were genocide, totally genocide. And at the end of the day, David wants to build a temple for God. And God says, you know, I can't, you know, look, I love you, bro. I used you as, like, I used you. You did exactly, you did it to the letter, but your hands are stained with blood. And you can't do this. You get what I'm saying? But he called David a man after God's own heart. Right? Exactly. Thank you. Even, even, even the Apostle Paul, right? He killed Christians threw them to lions. He was present at the first martyrdom of Stephen. He was the guy who was holding the clothes. Do you get what I'm saying? He was there. He stood over the clothes and watched people kill Stephen, right? And God used that guy and wiped away all his sins. Like, God, really seriously? God is not a moralist. And I feel this is my submission that will open uh, for questions. Uh, Apostle Ajani Aj Aj will handle that. I feel that the moment man submitted themselves to the knowledge of good and evil, God was like, ah, man would not be able to fully fulfill, forgive the repetition, fully fulfill his agenda as God, knowing the difference between good and evil. Because for God, Good and evil is one swirly mess. You know how it is, give you an example. You know, when an artist wants to paint a canvas, he starts out with all different colors, red, yellow, orange, blue, purple. But when he's making the art, he mixes the paints together, mixes the paints together. And he begins to draw and paint and do all the things he does, but he doesn't use the paints in isolation. He mixes the paints together for his purpose, for his agenda, which is to have an immaculate art piece. But the moment man goes into the place of, no, it's either purple or orange. God, it's almost like God is limited to say, there's only so much I can do with just purple and orange. This is supposed to be mixed into one whole, but now I can't have the canvas because you've limited the paint. Oh, you don't hear me what I'm saying. Like I can't have the canvas because you've limited the paint. Now, I'm not saying that being good is bad or being bad is good. I'm not saying that because now we live in a world that is filled with, we know, we know the difference. We know, thank you, Okay, We know the difference between right and wrong, right? Give you an example. So presidents have the ability to go to war and Give you an example. Let's say, let's say in the time of Osama bin Laden, let's, let's just use maybe some of these Al Qaeda guys. So um, I've watched in movies, and I'm sure you guys have probably seen the same, where you know the U.S., for example, would say, "Oh, we've identified this ISIS or Al Qaeda terrorist. He's number three in Al Qaeda. We have an opportunity to, to, to get him, but he's in a wedding, and there's going to be collateral damage." And they would ask the question that, "Hey." What is potential collateral damage? They'll say, oh, we, you know, we have to fight. We're going to lose 500 innocent civilians, but this is our only chance to get this guy. We can't extract him. We have to blow him up. But in blowing him up, we're going to have 500 civilians die. Is it bad <laughs> for the president to say all systems go, blow him up, blow them all up? Or should the president be like, no, we can't. You know, I'm not saying either if either is wrong. Do you get what I'm saying? But I'm saying for the greater good, for the greater good, cap not capturing that terrorist and saving the lives of 500 civilians is more detrimental 
than allowing 500 innocent civilians to die. Now to us on the ground, we may say that's terrible. 500 innocent civilians were hurt, so on and so forth. But to those who see from the, a, a bird's eye view, who understand the entire opportunity cost, they're like, see, this one man is worth at least 500 innocent lives. Because the havoc he's going to wreak from not getting him is going to be much more significant than 500 people take the shot. So there are no absolutes, but we filter this from the side of good and evil. But could it be possible, like I've said, that rather than limiting the paints at his disposal, God allows them to be one good goop of swirly mess, and he paints his canvas and ultimately makes a masterpiece out of it. So this is, this is my thought. We're going into Q&A. Um, I'm going to hand over to Apostle Ajane, and then we're going to take it up from there. So uh, yes, let's go. Okay, so the first question says, is eternal and immortal the same? I think it's the same. I think it's semantics. I think it's the same. Personally, I think it's the same. Um, immortal clearly suggests that you never run out of life and eternity, eternal. I mean, the whole, the whole concept of us as Christians saying that we're going to have, you know, we're going to live in eternity means we're not going to run out of life either. So personally, I think they're the same. I think they're the same. Exactly. He says we're his masterpiece, heir to the kingdom. There we go. There we go. Please um, drop your questions in the comments. And uh, 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 Another one. Um, could you kindly differentiate between time and eternity? Time and eternity. In my opinion, that's like the difference between a million and a billion. So um, I, I, read, I read an example and somebody said, um, um, if I if I remember correctly, somebody said a million, a million, let's say a million dollars worth of time was something within the regions of let's say something within the region of maybe like nine hours, and a billion dollars worth of time was something within the region of sixty four years. So imagine imagine comparing nine hours versus hypothetically sixty four years. Time is, time is the child of eternity. Time is the child of eternity. Eternity suggests like in, an infinite number, I mean, an infinite, infinite amount of time. So for example, between Jesus and now, we calculate 2000, 2000 plus years. But imagine thinking about the Big Bang and scientists suggest that, oh, the, you know, the earth has been around for about 7 billion years. Now think about that. God has been around before 7 billion years. So if you can count it, it's time. If you can't count it, it's eternity. You know what I mean? And eternity is inexhaustible. It's, it's time revolving in and of itself and never, you know, never coming, to, coming into that consciousness of it. So, I mean, it's, uh, time is a measure of eternity, bro. Yeah. What else do we got? Hit me. Um, someone said, I know you went through the original sin, but did we narrow it down to what it is? So sorry, I may have missed it being late and running around cooking. So I think maybe like a synopsis. Synopsis, okay. So um, in my opinion, where, where we talk about the original sin, um, first off, the concept of original sin of itself, right? Let me, let, let me, I don't want to mess with your theology, but I'll mess with it a little bit. The concept of, of, of original sin did not come into church history until the fifth century. So the concept of original sin, and I'm not doubting that it exists, I'm just saying that the concept called original sin did not come into church theology until the fifth century. And it was um, postulated by um, a saint called Augustine. All right, so he's, he's one of the church founders, a saint, we call him Saint Augustine. And Saint Augustine conceptualized the theory of original sin, and that came in the fifth century. That means prior to when scripture was cobbled and put together and all those things, the concept of original sin in and of itself was not a thing until the fifth century. So I'm just putting a hat on that to say that, mm, 
a lot of the things that we believe today are things that um, have evolved over time. Do you get what I mean? Has evolved over time. There's a lot of information that, um, so for example, the, the, the understanding the Jews have concerning, um, for example, the five books of the, the Bible, the Torah, is not what Christians tend to see. So I'll give you an example. So as Christians, right, a lot of the things we read in the Bible are like stories to us, right? But to Jews, for example, it's not stories, they're culture. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So it's like, um, um, I'm Nigerian. Okay, no, no, let me not even use Nigeria. So for example, somebody could be Scandinavian and they have stories about Norse gods like Thor and Odin and things like that. Now to us, as far as I'm concerned, Thor is a, is a Marvel superhero in the Avengers. That's who Thor is. But to somebody who's a Scandinavian, they can trace if technically Thor comes from legends of perhaps maybe real people who they knew. So they knew that, oh, Thor lived in this area. So for them, Thor is not a myth. Thor is part of their history. It's their culture. We read stories of Samson and Delilah. We're like, oh, Samson and Delilah. But as far as the Jew is concerned, they know where Samson lived. They can, tra they can trace his tribe. It's their culture, right? So because many of us who are Gentiles don't see scripture from that cultural context, the best it is to us is a story, right? So I'm saying that as church the theology evolved over time, there were different, exactly, there were different things that were um, propounded and professed that inevitably became church culture and has inevitably influenced our own idea of what Christianity and scripture is. So to answer your question uh, directly where original sin is concerned, um, my answer was God did not want them bound by the knowledge of good and evil because God as a being is not limited to a human concept such as good and evil. So God does not interfere with our free will, right? Even though there are contingencies, should we decide to go in different directions, which is why the Bible says that before the foundations of the earth, that God had slain Jesus Christ before the foundations of the earth. So God had finished the salvation of man before time even began. He had completed an eternity before time even began, right? So the concept of what we're discussing today as to why God didn't want it was God didn't want man bound because what you are conscious of, you are bound to. And God does not do moral relativisms. So the moment that Adam and Eve um, ate of the fruits, they retained their godlike capacity. So, for example, they retained their godlike authority. God had given them dominion. He didn't take that back. But even though he, he didn't take dominion, he took his access. He gave them authority, but they lost access. He gave them power, but they lost relationship, right? Um, man could no longer come into the fullest expression of who man could be, because even though man was now in the image of God, right, or in the likeness of God, in terms of character and competencies, they lost an, an essential part of God's image. So, for example, man lost things like omniscience. Man lost things like um, omniscience, which is the ability to know everything and all things. Because, I mean, think about it. The Bible says God brought the animals to Adam, and Adam named them all. How did he know what to name them? And the Bible says whatever he named them, that's what they became. That's some level of omniscience. We've lost that. But we get a little snippets of it here and there. We get things like oh, telepathy. And if you think about it, stuff like omniscience in the New Testament, it is, for the lack of a better term, rebranded in things like the spirits of words of wisdom or word of knowledge or the spirits of discernment. That's a level of omniscience on a micro level. Do you get what I'm saying? So just wanted to put that out there. Yes, also go on. I don't see um, any other ones, but I did see a hand raise. If you guys could drop your question in the chat. I think we can take a few hands as long as they're, as long as they're not spam people. If they're spam right. people, just they're not. we'll get rid of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, one just popped up. It says, isn't omniscience only reserved for God? But if you were like God at the beginning, don't you think you might have had it? <laughs> What we're having, what, go on, love, go on. There's one hand raised. I don't know how to pronounce his name, and I don't even want to remotely Olajimoke. mess it up. Yeah. Olajimoke. 
let's let's bring Alanja Michael up. Let's see what I think she has to say. I think she's a she. Alanja Michael, I think you're muted. Okay, muting. okay. Um, thank you. There you go. <laughs> okay, Hi. um, you can call me Ola Apostle. So, um. Thank you so much for this class. It's it's so good, so so good. Like I mean, I'm just jumping on my seat. So good. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking sometimes ago. My own is comment, right? How that what God was really for me in Genesis one, when God, when the Bible talks about God for me, man was the body. It wasn't the real man that He created. You know, he had created man already. Man was already created before he decided to form the body because he, he was a, already a done deal. You know, he had yeah. because we are spirit. And then so we have all of this omniscience and all of that. We have it. And we still experience that even now if we want yeah. to experience it, you know. But it's, it's just really beautiful because... I mean, I the body was going to die. I've, not, I've never thought about um, the death part, you know. Yeah. Um, the body was built to die because it is clay and yeah. clay would decay. It, but the man was not going to decay. So I lost yeah. my brother um, July last year. And I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you. So nothing, it was really, so I stood there, you know, when we went to bury him and I was looking out. I was like, where are you? You know, because I know you are not dead, because I know you are not this body that we're about to put into the ground. I just really want to know where he is. You know, I was just, I was staring into the air I re because I know we don't die. You know, because yeah. I know that much power that we carry. And I put on my status today that we will so much power that we do not know who we are. And it's a shame. Right, it's such a shame to believers that we have all of this power. There's so much power. The program I told you about last week, or the last time we had a class, I'd spoken to somebody who had been menstruated. She has been waiting for like seven years. She said she hadn't menstruated since January this year. And I had a one on one with her last week, Thursday, and she menstruated the next day, the day wow. after, coach. And I was like, I didn't do anything. She was in, she's in Abuja, I'm in Lagos. I didn't lay hands. I didn't do anything. I just needed her to see who she is. Yeah. And at that moment, she, 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 the, she became fertile. I mean, yeah. this is this, we, we are this powerful. We even can go back to the world and know who we really are. You know, and I just really want to say thank you. Thank you for all of what you're doing here. I'm, I'm here for all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elijah Mokeb. You know, just, just to even touch on the, the question about omniscience, I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of that nature, that, that perfect Adam, that second Adam. You know, the Bible would say things about Jesus that um, maybe people were talking, and, and the Bible would say, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them. Now, we would call that telepathy in the 21st century. But that's the level of omniscience that Jesus had. So the perfect representation of man that God had in mind was Jesus. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So in, in, the, in the sense of being 100% God and yet being 100% man. So Jesus could command the elements, guys, and the elements would obey him. I mean, think about the fact that he walked on water, right? Think of the fact that he had dominion over the earth. Genesis 1, 26, he had dominion of everything. So if he needed to get from point A to point B without being on a boat, he would step on water. And the Bible says the winds and the waves would obey him. That's what we lost. But that's what we gain when we come back into right standing and that relationship that we have with God again, where we, have, we still have rights, but we've lost certain things, which is why, I mean, I was thinking on self, can I tell you something that I hope will offend you because it scared the living Jesus out of me yesterday. I was thinking about that fact that, you know, the Bible says that after Jesus um, was baptized, you know, the Holy Spirit led him into the uh, desert to be tempted by the devil. Do you know you cannot be tempted by something you don't want? 
<laughs> Can I say this again? I'm sorry, I'm gonna upset, I'm gonna upset you. Do you know you cannot be tempted by stuff you don't like? Like I'm straight. If a guy hit on me and he says he's gay, I'm gonna be like, dude, like uh, 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 uh. I don't like it. No temptation. So for Jesus to be tempted, because don't think about it, guys. It's not random. What were the temptations of Jesus? The first one is if you know, um, turn stones into bread. You know, the second one was, oh, um, um, I'll give you the kingdoms of this earth and so on and so forth. Bow down and worship me. Uh, the third one was he put him on the temple and told him to jump or something like that. and He would have power. So the devil tempted Jesus with significant things. He tempted Jesus with, with a sense of his identity. Then tempted him with power and authority. He said to him, see, the kingdoms of this world have been given to me. I will give them to you. So he tempted Jesus with power. You want power? Influence? I got you. See, you already want it. I will give you. Don't kill yourself. I will give you. Right? He tempted him with some sorts of, um, for the lack of a better term, influence, visibility, notoriety, fame. Call it fame. Let's call it fame. He said, jump off. We know that God is committed, that he will not let you touch the ground. You wouldn't even be hurt. He will command angels to catch you. So if you jump, we know that angels will show up. Dude, show up. So even Jesus was tempted by things he wanted. It is not a temptation if you don't want it. I don't know if you, if you meditate on that just a little bit, it would, it would put things into perspective a little bit for you. When the Bible would say things like, even Jesus was touched by the feelings of our infirmities yet without sin. That's, I think it's a humbling statement, absolutely. Anyone else got a question? Questions, 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 guys. I know Weird MC, my sister had a question. Her hand was raised previously. So if you're still here, sis, please feel free. Anyone else, guys, ask a question. Don't be shy. This is not a monologue. This is a, this is a conversation. I see you, Iris. How are you? All right. Hit me up with your questions, guys. Go on, Ashley. Yes. Okay. So my question is not related to the actual material, but the response to the material is my question. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate like intellectual intimacy with the Lord. I appreciate being able to wrestle with things that I've already decided I know. And then he turns around and tells me that I don't know anything, but I've just kind of been observing like my own frustration with trying to wrap my mind around what you've been teaching. And then even observing other people's commitment to what they already understand and being stretched in that way. And so my question is for you, it seems like this is like your daily fun time with the Lord, just wrestling with things. So for all of us, like what are some tips you have for allowing your mind to be renewed in a way that you're not used to without getting like offended or overwhelmed or shutting down? Like how do you wrestle well with the Lord with these things without like getting crazy? <laughs> I think that's a fantastic question. I mean, I think for me, you know, the Bible says it's the glory of, um, of the Lord to conceal a thing, but it's the glory of kings to reveal them. And I think for me, I think I got sent on this journey because I was tired of seeing um, all these heroes of faith like super, super, superheroes. And God told me one day that, you know, everybody in, in scripture were real people with real issues helped by a real God. You know, real people with real issues helped by a real God. And for me, it, it causes me to ask questions like, I don't know about you. God's telling me to sacrifice my child because I've only got a, a, a child. I ain't going to do it. I'm going to be like, dude, heck to the no. I'm not going to do it, right? But what, what, what is it about the relationship that these people had with God that made them do things that was seeming, seemingly extraordinary? But then also, I think in my quest for understanding God more, I began to understand different contexts. So I've read and I'm reading pretty wide, right? I'm reading pretty wide. So a lot of things that we read in scripture because we are Gentiles for the lack of a better term, we don't have a lot of context for the things that we read. So we just read the Bible, we read the, the verses, it, it doesn't mean anything to us, right? It, it's like, I'm Nigerian and you're, you're American. If I spoke to you about it, something happening in Nigeria, you don't have a context for it. For you, it's just information. You're like, oh, okay, cool, Steve, sounds great. But you don't, you don't have any context for it until you come into my culture, then you would understand it. 
And so what I've done is over time, I've started reading scripture, especially the, the Old Testament and even understanding the new in context. And I see things that I'm like, oh, really? How come I never saw this before? Or, you know what, let me ask about this. And I start doing a lot of research and, you know, asking questions and spending time with God. So for me, it's about asking questions. Like the day, the day God told me, uh, when I was explaining, when I was, I was asking God, I was like, you know, God, I want to be a man after your heart. Lord, I want to be just like David. I want to be spending time in your presence. But, you know, Lord, I really hate praying. Praying can be so boring and I can't fast. Oh, Jesus, God, once you tell me to fast, my entire body's like, no, we're not doing it. 12 o'clock, we break it. That's it, right? We go, my body just goes on strike. And I was complaining like, oh, Lord, you know, David was a man after your heart and he would sing and look at all the Psalms he wrote and the Proverbs and this. And God was like, that's not what it means to be a man after my heart. I'm like, but I mean, come on now. But I look at all the things that David did in this. It's like, that's not what he said. David fulfilled my agenda to the letter. I'm like, your agenda? And then I start trying to understand what these words mean. What does it mean to have an agenda? What does it mean, you know? For me, the, the fun part was that one about, you know, seek you first the kingdom of, of heaven and his righteousness. I had to go and Google the words again like I was an idiot. What does kingdom mean? What does righteousness mean? Because righteousness is a holy... Let me give you an example. Do you know that... Okay. There's a term we use in scripture. We say, oh, you know, God is holy or the Holy Spirit. So when we say holy... We only think of something in the, in the perspective of sinless, something that is without sin. But holy is not also, it's not only things that are without sin. Holy, the word holy means set apart for a unique purpose. So for example, the Holy Spirit is the spirit that sets you apart for a unique purpose. <laughs> but I used to think that the Holy Spirit was just a Holy Spirit in reverence and just, you know, don't offend the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he, he's very emotionally upset. He gets very emotional. Don't offend him. He, he's very touchy. Don't offend the Holy Spirit because he's sinless. He's righteous. But then I recognize that the word holy means to be set apart. That's why God will say things like, you're a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. You are a nation that is set, up, set apart for a specific purpose. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, Really? So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not for me to be speaking in tongues and shouting and yiggity, yiggity, yaggity, yaggity. It's about being set apart for God's unique purpose. Then the question now is, so what is God's unique purpose? It becomes a rabbit hole from one question to another question and another question and so on and so forth. That's, that's, that's how I get excited. That's, that's what happens to me. Thank you. <laughs> um, Iris has her hand up. So can you dissect between um, the physical man, Adam, and the spirit man? Because you said uh, you thought he would die. And then in the Bible it says uh, the wages of sin is death. So and because of what Jesus did, that's the only way to set, um, reset the bar with the wages, so he's the only way he can pay those wages. So why would you, I mean, we live in an eternity, either in heaven or hell. So yeah. you cannot die then. And if your flesh is just like a car or like a vehicle for your spirit, yeah. So what, what is the, so that you lost me there because you said, I got you. yeah, okay, good. I got you. I got you. Great question. Thank you. So, so God, when God creates man first, he creates his spirits. Um, and that is, it is the spirit of man that he gives the authority, he, his dominion. It is the spirit of man that he makes in his image and his likeness. It is the spirit of man, but God puts man on earth you know the bible says he creates man and then puts him in the garden i think if i'm not mistaken he creates man first and then puts him in the garden second if i'm not mistaken so that suggests to me first so he, he builds the spirit of man but then the spirit of man 
and not in habits. Thank you, sis. The spirit of man cannot inhabit the earth. Spirits are not legal entities on the earth. Only humans are legal entities on the earth. So he builds the spirit of man, or he creates this, creates man, but he needs a physical representation of that man on the earth. In the same way that we are on the earth, physical representations of the image of God. So the image of God doesn't necessarily mean me looking exactly like God. I have his spirit, my spirit resembles him, and I have his authority, right? So when he puts him on, in the garden, and man begins to sin, and he does all those things. And don't forget, the, the theologians have defined sin as a separation from God. And if you notice, the moment Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing that happened was that they were separated from God. First off, by themselves, where they willfully separated from God by running away from him where Jesus has come in the New Testament to say that, listen, when you sin, don't run away from God, run towards him, which is a different narrative. But by themselves, first off, they separated themselves, they ran from him. And then, interestingly enough, the moment they run from him, he kills an animal, he commits a sacrifice, kills an animal, a lamb or a, an animal, takes the skin and makes clothes out of them and hands them to the, you know, to Adam and Eve. And then when they get kicked out of the garden, he bars the ex the entrance to the garden, causing separation between man and God. And from those points, from that point on, the touch points between man and God became fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer until even 500 years before Jesus came, um, from Malachi to from Malachi to Matthew. There were 500 years where there was no contact with God in any way, shape, or form. There was no revelation. There was no prophecy. There was nothing. Then Jesus came to restore the relationship with God. Can you, re can you, can you, um, let me see. I think I, there was a question I just saw from Iris. Can you, so many questions. Uh, can, can you hear, can you hear God anymore? Yes, yes. So, yes. So for them, um, they felt separated from God. And that's what Jesus came to restore Jesus came to restore the rights and relationships with God. That's why Jesus will say things that no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. I'm going to say something that sounds a little controversial, but please forgive me, but you know, maybe another time I'll explain it. Christianity is the only religion, as far as I'm aware, that has a paternal or father-son relationship. So Islam is not a father-son relationship. Islam is a master-servant relationship. Judaism is a master-servant relationship. Christianity is a father-son relationship. So, and I'm not saying this is fact. I'm just saying it could be possible hmm, that other religions, I don't know, I'm just saying it could be possible that other rel religions may touch an aspect of God. And this is not a blanket statement. Just, I'm just trying to be 100% objective. It could be possible that other relationships touch the side of God but Christianity is the relationship that allows you to have sonship with God, right? Other relationships, other religions may have a father-son relation. I won't even call that a relationship, father-son transaction. But with Christianity, we have a father, sorry, with other religions, they have a master-servant transaction. But with Christianity, we have a father-son relationship, which is why Jesus would say that no man comes to the father unless the spirit draws him that he gives us his Holy Spirit. I mean, because what did man lose? Man lost, his spirit was no longer alive. And remember that I said in the garden, the human spirit, Adam's spirit was rejuvenated by the presence of being with God. He had the spirit of God. He was in the presence of God. So he didn't need eternal life. Do you get what I'm saying? He didn't need eternal life because his life was rejuvenated by the presence of God. But the moment he sinned, God says, don't let him touch the tree of life because he will live forever. And we don't want him to live forever in this fallen state, which meant that man was not immortal. Man was not eternal. Man was, for the lack of a better term, was like a battery that was being powered by a big generator. And the moment you took the battery away from the generator, from the circuit, all of a sudden the battery, the battery life, no pun intended, begins to reduce, it begins to reduce until the point where it no longer has any more juice of itself. So Jesus comes and quote unquote, reconnects us with the generator. In fact, he now says, you don't have to wait to go back to the generator. I'm giving you a generator that you can carry with you. It's a Holy Spirit. 
He will reactivate you consistently. He will. He is now God with you, God in you. Do you get what I'm saying? So before with, with Adam and Eve and God in the garden, it was God with us. With Jesus, it was still God with us. But with the Holy Spirit now, it is God in us. Do you get what I'm saying? So we have that eternal life as the case may be. So yes, right back at you. Uh, another one said, considering what God said in Jesus, in Genesis 3.22, was Satan really lying? Well, you know, like I said, um, to, have, to have a lie, you just need to twist the truth. So he, he, told, he, told two, he told two truths and one lie. If I think, if I see correctly, let me open it again. I think Satan told three, three, three truths, two, uh, two truths and one lie. So he says, um, verse four, Genesis, Genesis three, verse four, the servant said to the woman, you will certainly not die. That's a lie. He said, God knows the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be, your eyes will be opened. That's true. He says, you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. That's false. They, they weren't going to be like God. They were already like God. So, God, so Satan doesn't need to give you 100% lie. He just needs to take the truth out of, he just needs to take the truth out of the statement and it becomes an entire lie. That's why you need to know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's why, that's why we spend time on scripture, spend time with God, helping him to, helping us to understand. That's why the Holy Spirit teaches us all truths. So yes. Someone else's question says, when Adam sinned, was dominion taken from him? And then I think the final question says, after Jesus resurrected, he told Mary Magdalene not to touch him because he hadn't gone to the father yet, why? Okay, um, <laughs> I was going to say that my okay. I, I, maybe I was going to say something funny, but let me not, let me not say that. Um, so the first part was, um, um, did did man lose dominion? Yes, he did. When Adam fell, man lost dominion because God handed the authority of heaven and earth to Adam. When Adam sinned. A transaction took place where Luke, where Satan, for the lack of a better term, now had authority. Which is why, if you remember, when Satan was tempting Jesus, he says to him, "All authority has been given to me." It was true. All authority has been given to me, and I will give it to whomever I want. I will give it to you, right? That's why, if you now remember, after Jesus died and resurrected, particularly after he resurrected, the Bible says that. Um, when he descended into hell, when um, Jesus descended into hell, he took the keys, right? He took the authority back from Satan, right? And the Bible says he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men, so on and so forth, right? So a, tra a legal transaction took place where Adam previously was the God. Remember, I said God is not a name. God is his office. Where Adam was previously the God of this world and based on his fall, an exchange occurred where Satan became the God of this world, right? And then after Jesus died, Jesus then, quote unquote, became again the God of this world and then handed back dominion to us as joint heirs. So we now have the same legal rights, legal status that Jesus has. So yes, um, Adam lost it, Lucifer took it, Jesus took it back and Jesus gave it back to us. All right, so that's why we have to have the authority of the believer. So if you don't know your authority, if you don't know your rights as a son of God, you will always be bullied by the devil who, who, do, who, who knows you don't know what your rights are. A lot of Christians don't know what their rights are, right? So you need to spend time with the constitution. You know, that's why the Bible says that an heir, if he's a child, will be put under the um, stewardship of guardians until he becomes a man. So that's the problem many of us have. We're not spending time. We don't know what our rights are. Um, then the second question was, um, why did Jesus tell Mary not to touch her? I'm going to tell you, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the real answer to that, to be honest. I'm not even going to pretend. But I do think that um, I, I do think that he, he had his, um, I don't know. I think he, he had not fully translated. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a little bit beyond my pay grade. So I'm still... Um, I'm still getting there. 
Thomas eventually touched him, didn't he? But yes, but that was several days later, Iris. I think it was several days later. But immediately he came out. So I think she's talking about when um, he, he comes out, the day he resurrects and Mary, Mary sees him and she wants to touch him and he's not yet ascended to his father. I don't know whatever happened there. I don't know. So I can't tell you right off the bat. I don't know. <laughs> I think that was it. Also, that's it. Yeah. You know, this is this is the thing that I, I want to say that when you spend time to get to know more and more of God, you realize you know less and less. That's the beautiful thing. That when you spend more and more time with God, you realize you know less and less. And there's still like, even if we lived forever, we would not know. There's still so much to know we don't know. Right, but the beautiful thing is that we have the Holy Spirit and He teaches us all, all things and leads us into all truth. And the purpose of sense, you know, I was thinking about it as we close, that the the purpose of sense, in my opinion, is I want to I want to raise, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but it'll come to me, but I want to raise minimum a hundred of us in each of these sectors who will go in and begin to cause transformation beyond just church. So people, I want, I, I want to be able to mentor a minimum of a hundred people who are going into the political space to create change. So they're going to start from either Congress, excuse me, Congress or the, the House of Representatives or whatever, 100 people who are going in deliberately. And these people, hear me, these people will be Democrats, these people will be Republicans, there will be Libertarians, there will be an APC, PDP, whatever, you're, there will be Tories and, and conservatives, because the goal is not to create, you know, if you're going into politics, the goal is not to create a Christian political party. No, they can, they can drop a nuclear weapon on all you guys, and you guys will be blown up. The goal is to go into the Democratic Party, go into the Republican Party, go into all, infiltrate. So we need, I'm, I'm thinking that by the grace of God, we can raise 100 people who are going in there. And then people in the business and the marketplace, a minimum of 100 people who may not necessarily, I hate to break it to you, sing Christian songs or do Christian movies. And I'm not saying that you can't, but I'm saying that there are people who need to learn the system of Babylon. And many of you are already, exactly, says, many of you are already in the system of Babylon, but you're not thinking about it from a kingdom agenda to take over. So you're just participating and you just say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not of this world and I'm, you know, so on and so forth. So the goal is at minimum 100 people who are going into um, music and entertainment to shape culture. So the way that our Rainbow Sprinkles people are sprinkling stuff, you two, you're sprinkling stuff, you're creating shows that can be on Netflix and are fantastic content, even if they don't have any Rainbow Sprinkles. And even if they do have rainbow sprinkles, your salt is even a lot more thicker than whatever those guys have got planned. I'm thinking about another hundred people who are going into the media, right? Who are thinking of also either starting or going into CNN or Fox or whatever the case may be. And some of you may be, may have to start your own as the case may be. But for, for a minimum of 100 people into these areas, and I think that we can do that over a course of conservatively over a course of one year where we can measure you know what i mean i'm not interested in please forgive me i'm not interested in winning a billion souls for christ i don't want i really don't let the people who want to do that let them do that i want to be able to be able to mentor 100 people who go into these areas and once those 100 people have done it then we can now send another 200 people and then we can send another 1000 people in all those areas and we can begin to make a difference you know so that's the thought that I have, and I'm sure that God will give us wisdom and guidance as we go forward. But tonight has been great. I've had an amazing time. Apostle Ajne, you've been great. I'm just reading your message. Oh, yes, please. I'd love to have you. Absolutely. All right. So thank you for moderating this. This was fantastic. Thank you guys for hanging with me tonight um, on one of these impromptu conversations. But that's my goal. I really do think that if we get 100 people in each of these systems to infiltrate these systems um slowly and surely we would rise to the top of these mountains it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a climb every mountain getting to the top of the mountain is a climb you know what i mean it's a climb we must be prepared we must be deliberate we must be intentional but the goal is that a hundred of us minimum within one year across each location can get infiltrated into these systems and begin to create change from where we are 
um, but we're going to start talking into that, talking about that as we go along. Um, Jamaka says the ideas in my head. I feel like I don't have the platform for it. What can I do? Find a place to serve, sweetheart. Find a place to serve. Some some of the ideas you have in your head are not in isolation. God will put you in Egypt. He will put you in Babylon. He will put you in the systems to observe and learn and do. You know that's what I think you need to do. So, Apostle Ajane, please close it out for us. And um, yeah. All right, guys. So thank you. Um, we'll keep the conversation going in the group. And um, thank you for hanging with me tonight. If you've got any questions in the group, I'd be glad to share um, answer. The replay will be available shortly. I'll post it in the Telegram group. If you are not in the Telegram group, um, let me post the link. Just a moment. Um, I'll post the link. If you're not in the Telegram group and you would like to join us, um, please feel free to join us. Uh, where is that link right there? Uh, found it. So if you would like to join us in a Telegram group and you're not already there, um, please feel free to join us. There we go. All right, enough said. Thank you guys. Good night, good day, whatever time of day it is. Speak soon. God bless you.